Um, I don't want you to hear too much about me. I'm not very interesting. I have four great people who are, so let's get straight to business. I will bring them up here one at a time. Let's start with someone I think we've heard from already today, and if you haven't heard from him today, you will know him immediately. Mr. Edmund King, OBE. <laughs> Never mind the oh, Norwich, is it? Well, what's that music all about? On the Ball City, it is the oldest football song in history. And which club is it? Yay. Bottom of the league, Norwich City. We'll get better. Edmund, you're very welcome. It's great to sit down here and, and, and chat to you. Um, I did a little bit of research before coming along. Um, and I've just, you know, the past few days I've got, uh, I've been on Google News and, and there's comments from you on smart motorways, potholes, graduated driver licensing. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. Um, how do you manage it? How have you got to that position that you are kind of Mr. Mister, Mister Quote on anything automotive? Well, I guess, I, I guess my background, um, I've always been interested in cars. I grew up um, in Norwich, I lived next door but one to Colin Chapman, the chairman of Lotus Cars. So when I was eight years old, he flew me to my first Grand Prix. So I used to see Lotus Alans going out of Kringleford and speeding down to Hethel. So that was an early memory. And, and then after that, you know, I, I got into politics, I got into journalism, I worked in radio in Los Angeles for K Earth 101, classic rock and roll. Um, <laughs> And then when I decided I needed a proper job, came back to the UK and started getting involved in campaigning around roads, firstly for the British Roads Federation. Um, and then that other breakdown organization that possibly I can't mention here, but three letters beginning with R, um, and ultimately with the AA. But for me, it brings together kind of passion about road safety, about motoring, about politics, about communication, about campaigning. So what I try and do, so if you take smart motorways, you know, you take an issue, you take a safety issue, um, you develop a campaign around it to try and change things. So, you know, that, that is the ethos of what I try and, try and do, Ch change things for the better, particularly road safety. And how much of it is, is what Edmund King thinks, and how much of it is, is governed yeah. by the millions of people yeah. that you're... I mean, the one, one thing we do, we have this AA Populist panel, which is the biggest dedicated motoring panel in Europe, more than 200,000 people, and we go to that panel every month on issues. So every month I get surveys of, 20, of 18 to 20,000 drivers, proportionate. So... You know, we know their attitudes on everything from 80 mile an hour speed limits to drink drive limits to smart motorways, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot is, is really based on that. We try and listen, you know, to, to our members because, you know, people, people join the AA, yes, for breakdown, but, you know, it's quite important that we then go out to them with this polling to get their views on, on, on the broader world. And seeing what you see, does that lead you to be kind of optimistic or, or sort of depressed compared with what you were like five years ago, well, for example? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess looking back longer than that, optimistic. I mean, things have changed in the last 10, 15 years. You know, I've been in this game probably about 30 years. So, you know, if you look at um, deaths on the roads, whatever, but the last five years, I think it has stabilised and it shows there's much more that we need to do. And Sometimes I do think it, it is the simple things like, like the tailgating cam campaign, the space invaders. I think that's really good. It's issues like that. And sometimes I just think it's little, little tips. I mean, I've, I've one of my own that I always apply. So on a journey like this, going home 110 miles or whatever, of course I'll concentrate and stick to the speed limits and all of that. But when I get within 10 minutes of home, I crank up a gear, and I actually say to myself, it might sound a bit anoraki, but I say to myself, look, you've had a safe journey, you've got 10 minutes more to go. And that's often when your mind switches off, what am I having for supper, what are the kids doing tonight, what's, what's on TV, and that's where someone steps out or a cycle comes out and you don't spot it. So I kind of zone in myself, that last 10 minutes, the, the, the extra thing, like I don't want anything to happen now, there's a car park there, someone could step out. And that for me works. And 
Sometimes I think getting messages, we, we overcomplicate it. You know, listening to some of the stuff today, I mean, it's great, but it's very, very complicated. And sometimes if you can get those simple messages. I mean, another one that we did in 2014, just a simple message, and it came from our patrol of the year, Tony Rich, who a friend of his had been killed in a motorcycle crash, awful crash. And I was going to our trustees at the AA Charitable Trust and looking at something around motorcycle and cycle safety and training courses and this, that, and the other, and nothing quite worked. And Tony came up to me and he, he said, Ed, I've, I've got this idea, it's a germ of an idea, to have a little sticker on your wing mirror. So for a driver, every time you look at your mirror, you think bikes. And it was a simple, great idea. So we developed that idea. We got rid of five million stickers free through Halfords. And we promoted that campaign with a video with a naked cyclist, et cetera, et cetera. And that was from Tony's simple idea. And that's now gone to 26 countries from Iceland to Iran who've got little Think Bike stickers. All our patrols have it. Our driving instructors have it. So, you know, for the patrols alone, who were in those vans in urban areas, city centres, just looking at that mirror, seeing that sticker, little simple thing, but it, but it actually puts safety top of the mind. Let's just focus for a moment on simplicity. I don't want to spend too much time on smart motorways, but the feedback is that they're too complicated for the average motorist. It's, I mean, I get quite frustrated hearing kind of phrases like it's a live lane and it's a running lane. People, people don't understand that. The, the, the public don't understand that. Yeah. How, mean, how but, can you simplify it and but, then make it work? But to be honest here, and this is sometimes where stats, you know, and everyone this morning quoting, well, they're safe. Look at the M25, look at the stats. The way I look at this, I listen to calls from people who break down. And when I listen to a call from a family of five who are in the inside lane of the M6, whose power's gone, who have got no lights in their car, I don't care what the stats are. That isn't good, and it can be better. So, you know, the, the simplest analogy is, is Walt Disney in Disneyland. And when he looks at his parks, and if he can see that bin, you can see that bin over in the corner there. If you can see that bin, 95% of the people put their rubbish in that bin. If you can't see that bin, a proportion will drop their rubbish. With smart motorways, there is a simple solution. You double the number of laybys so that almost everyone at any stage, and one of our colleagues last night from the British Horse people was, was telling me, you know, he broke down on the M6, I think it was, his electrics went, he managed to get over and there happened to be a hard shoulder. But it's that kind of situation. So by doubling the number of laybys, the emergency refuge areas, we're not allowed to call them laybys, that, that would give drivers a chance to get out of that live lane. We've been consistent on this. We, we've said it from the start. We've said it to the Transport Select Committee. I've been through probably five or six different ministers making the same argument. And it was quite interesting last weekend for ex-transport ministers all wrote to the Times at actually agreeing with our position and saying that you do need more emergency refuge areas. So to me, this, this is common sense. It's not stats, it's common sense. It is not safe to break down in a live lane, no matter what the technology to detect you. If you're on a motorcycle, if you've got disabled people, if you've got kids, if you can't get out of the car, you know, so... I've got, I've got to say, no matter what the stats on the M25 say, and the M25 is not representative of the other motorways, look at the M1, we will continue campaigning on this till we get it changed. What I'm just going to do now, I've, I've mentioned all these things that you, you quote on so much. The emergency fund to help repair potholes is welcome news for Britain's crumbling road network. Um, what have we got here? Drivers sticking religiously to the speed limit still face the threat of smartphone zombies. What, what, what does that mean? No, Let's put I that mean, in one, context. One of the arguments about speeding and intelligent speed adaptation, you know, some people say it will save the world. You know, yes, it can improve things, and of course people should stick to speed limits. But my point around this is not just speed limits. You can stick to a speed limit and still crash, because you're not concentrating. And this is the kind of argument with some of the technology. Of course, 
um, crash avoidance technology is good. But, but it's not just about speed limits. And it, it is about things like close following, driver distraction, being on the mobile phones, et cetera. So it's not always as, as simplistic on that. On potholes, it's an interesting one because the, it, there are two sides to this. W one is when there are potholes, after the beast from the east, we noticed our breakdowns at the AA went up about 15, 16%. When we analyzed it, it was all punctures, wheel damage, suspension. And it was due to the state of the roads. And then equally, if you're a cyclist or a motorcyclist or indeed a car driver, and I've had my car damaged by potholes in, in St Albans and somehow it got into the national press that the suspension had gone and, and all of that. But potholes, it's important for safety, but it's also important for the economics of drivers. It is very expensive, you know, if you're in your tyre, you're in your wheel, so I think that, that's a sensible thing that everyone should agree on. Now, I hope we have a, a little clip here because you, you talk about so many different things, so many different uh, areas of, of, of the automotive world. Let's see what you might have to say when things get icy. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 I'd forgotten about that. That's Eloise and Lucas no. giving me a soaking. Yeah. Lost, lost for words. Now, tell us about a sort of typical day at the office then. Well, what, what I like about my job is that there probably isn't a typical day because things change. You know, the first thing I do is look at the news feeds first thing, what's happening in the world, look at the press association, what are the stories out there, are there transport stories, you know, should we be commenting on it? But it's very hard to plan a day. You know, our main office is in Basingstoke, but I tend to be in London most of the time because things happen. And when the TV want you, they want you in London. Radio's not so bad. I have an ISDN at home in Basingstoke in London. So radio, you can almost do anyway. TV, you can't. So I tend to be um, in London. So it could be dealing with the media. It could be writing a submission for a select committee. It could be doing with broader AA issues that I deal with as well at the PLC level um, for, for AA. I like to go out with a patrol at least once every six months or so, which gives you a real insight into some of the dangers faced on, on, on the road. You know, little things we've supported this slow down or move over campaign. If, if a patrol vehicle is, is on a hard shoulder, if there is a hard shoulder, even with lights coming on, if vehicles are coming along and they see that, if they've got the chance to do it, they should indicate um, and move over or at least slow down. And we'd like to see that incorporated into the highway code. So we've had meetings with Jesse Norman and all, all sorts about that. So it, 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 it's a combination of working with our team, looking at campaign ideas, working for the charitable trust, um, do, doing media stuff and events. So, you know, for me, it, it, it's incredibly enjoyable because all those three things are kind of my passions. Well, perhaps you can share some practical tips. We talk about your relationship with the media. What do they want and, and how, how have you made that relationship work? Because we may be, the rest of us, nervous of, of having mm. conversations with the media. We're concerned they might have their own agenda. You know, we're the sensational mm. is what matters most. Mm but you seem to have a relationship mm. where, you know, that's successful for you. So some tips for the rest of us. I mean, it, it is interesting because a lot of people are scared of the media. And in my, I don't know, 25, 30 years dealing with them, I've been rightly stitched up twice. And yeah, th those were fairly major. One was the front page of the Sunday Times. One was the front page of the Sun. And they, they were fairly major stitch up stories that I could go into. But, but apart from those, the rest of the time, um, I've had a really good relationship with the media. And what it, what it is, if the media gets something wrong, I mean, Christian Woolmer, when he was on The Independent, quite often wrote some things that were wrong about what, what we were saying. But I would phone up Christian, and I would have an honest discussion. No, I wouldn't rant at him. I would have an honest discussion and saying, actually, Christian, that is wrong. That's not our position. What and then he would respect me for doing that. Whereas if you ignored it or ranted at him, he, he would do the same again. So it's about developing that relationship. But it's also about, you know, some of the journalists are a little bit lazy. So it's helping them to find the best stories. 
And, you know, that takes thorough research. It takes freedom of information requests. It takes reading reports that the journalists haven't got time to, to look at. So sometimes you are kind of doing their investigative research. And what you tend to do then, you look around and think, well, who could best use that? Do you put it out as an exclusive rather than a press release? And sometimes that, that's the best thing to do. You have to, have to make a judgment call. But obviously, if you are giving them something that makes a story, if it can be backed up, if it's good for your cause, your campaign, what, whatever it is, that, that's the way, the way it works. And yeah, gen generally, I, I have a very good relationship you know, with the press, whether it's print, broadcast, or more and more now, online as well. Before we call up some more esteemed guests, just give me an idea, you know, what are the big things on the horizon for you? Maybe the next yeah. months, years even. I mean, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of the debate, obviously, environment has come up a notch, so there's a lot of the debate we're involved in around electric cars, alternative fueled cars, a lot around that. A lot of, around the automation, driverless technology, so we're, we're involved in a lot of the talks about that, both from a safety point of view, but also if you think about the AA from, from a business point of view, you know, our, our business is dealing with cars that break down, you know, and a lot of people say, oh, electric cars, they won't break down as much because they haven't got as many moving parts. And what's quite interesting, the breakdowns we're seeing are the traditional breakdowns. They are the punctures, they are the wheels, they are the losing of the keys, they are the batteries, not, not the main battery for the car, but the 12-volt battery running out. So there are a number of things on, on there. I think, you know, future technology, how we adapt to it, how we make it safer. I think those, those are all important things. And, <coughs> and obviously, discussion around the environment, whether it's around low emission zones in, in towns and cities. And, you know, what we ask for there, you know, our members as, as drivers are also residents, they're also fun. They care about air quality, but what they tell us and what the fleets tell us, what they don't like is the lack of consistency. So you have an ultra low emission zone in London where you can have Euro 6 diesels, where you have an area in Bristol where you cannot have even the Euro 6 diesels. And it's, it's that lack of coordination that I think gets people. And, lack of the kind of long-term warning and incentives. You know, we, we want longer-term incentives for plug-in cars, but we want it to last for a while so that fleets can think, actually, if I'm planning my fleet for next year and the year after, I'll buy EVs because there'll still be this grant. And fleets are very important because the majority of people don't buy new cars, they buy used cars. So if you can get fleets to green their fleet first, that will follow on into the used car market. So, you know, I, I do think the next, fifth, the next five years in auto, automotive history and development will probably be much more important than the last 10 or 15 I hope you've reserved EVK1 as your, as your personal Yeah, I, I did try and have buy. a blog, Living with an EV by EV King, but our website people didn't like that very much, so they got rid of my V initial, but I thought it was good, but anyway. Edmund King, thank you very thank much you. so far. Stay where you are, if you will. Um, and, and we will move on, because I'm very pleased to, to welcome my next guest now. Um, uh, she attended one of the most pre prestigious boys' public schools in the UK. She used to sell batteries, and she sailed the Atlantic. Those are three, I hope, accurate, interesting things about my next guest, Sally Lines, OBE. <laughs> Hi, Gabriel. You, wherever you like. Very warm welcome. Thank you for I'll coming. I'll do an Edmunds. <laughs> okay. So am I right in that? Have you no. sold batteries? No, I didn't sail the Atlantic. You got that wrong. Oh, where did you sail then? We sailed across the Bay of Biscay. Oh, well that, <laughs> I'm sure that could have its challenges, though. And it, <laughs> Everything on, else was completely <laughs> spot on. You were OK. So what's this about a boys' public school? You were the only girl at yes. a prestigious boys' public school. Yes. Tell us more. How did that happen? It happened because my dad was a geography geology teacher at Radley College. Um, we lived there all my life, and the teacher's um, children um, 
boy or girl had the opportunity to go to the sixth form at a fraction of the price that the public school boys had to pay. So I was asked when I was a rebellious, um, revolting teenager whether I wanted to go to an all-boys school at the age of 16. <laughs> and I went, yes! Um, I happened to be in a convent at the time, uh, all-girls convent, and uh, having religion pushed down my throat um, quite repulsively. And um, so I burned my bridges spectacular with the nuns um, and then realised that my best friend who lived next door was actually not going to the sixth form, whereas I thought I was going to go with someone else my age who was a female, and she pulled out. So I was on my own, basically. <laughs> Amazing. Character building stuff, I think yeah. you can call it. I'm sure it is. Well, we'll move on from there straight away because I'm sure he, folks here will be very interested in the role you have um, and the responsibilities that you hold with that role. Um, but let's find out, first of all, I mean, you're fairly fresh into the road safety world. Yes. Um, so what do you bring with you? How does your experience match up? You know, what similarities are there with what you did before and what you do now? And, and, and what new kind of challenges did you face and have to get to grips with? Um, well, I've been a charity chief exec since 2004, so it's a, it's a long period of time. And what you realise after a while is that it doesn't actually matter what the charity does, so long as you believe in it. And um, the skills of a charity chief exec are very, very transferable. Um, so I didn't take the job of um, the Donkey Sanctuary charity chief exec in Exeter um, because I just don't think I could stand on a podium and be passionate about that. I'm sure there are people who can be. Um, but having come from the social enterprise world, uh, changing lives every single day for people with learning disabilities, mental health problems, getting jobs, um, and, and building the whole sector of employment for for people who otherwise wouldn't be in jobs. I just had this drive to do something that I knew would make a real difference um, to, to everybody in this country. This, this job was unique. It still is quite a unique role. Um, the new bit for me, so the bit that's different for me personally, is the grant giving. That's actually quite hard because I've been a frontline service provider for years, where I've seen the difference I'm making every single day, right in front of me. Um, grant giving, you actually, you're entirely dependent on the project that you're funding to meet their objectives if you're going to meet your objectives as an organisation. So um, the, the trust um, has not been going very long, as you know, since 2014. We've run four rounds of funding, £2.7 million awarded over that time to 35 different projects. Uh, 35 very, very different projects. And um, what I was able to bring in was, was the ability to take a step back from those first four rounds and say, how's that gone? Is it... Is it meeting the needs of the organisation in terms of its original purpose, um, or could we be doing things differently? And working together with a fantastic board of trustees and, and a very small staff team, three full-time equivalent staff, including myself, we were able to come up with a five- to ten-year strategy for the charity to meet its overall objectives, but obviously using the grant giving as the medium for that. And it... That's what resulted in us changing our grant giving program quite significantly this year and next year and future years because we've got to be a lot more focused with our funding. We are going to sit on our projects. So if there's anyone in the audience thinking of applying, be prepared for partnership um, in a very positive way. But our values are rigor, independence and challenge, knowledge and partnership. And the projects that we work with should expect to get all of those from us. Well, we will, we'll, we'll come on to that and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll hopefully get some practical tips from you if anyone is um, thinking mm. about making an application. But first of all, let's get things into perspective because I suppose most charities come from an organisation that sets up a charity. Yep. The Road Safety Trust kind of did it the other way around. We so did. For, for our, to, to help us understand, you know, what's the relationship with the police or with UK Road and Endors, and how does it all work, and who owns what? Okay, well, I can safely say I had nothing to do with all of that, um, how it was before, but um, basically the Endors scheme is, is operated on behalf of the police, um, and previously it was in a different company, 
and uh, for a variety of reasons, the police chose to change that situation so that they created a charity to sit over the company that would run the Endors courses. Um, so we, it's the timing that's different, actually, not the structure. So it's, it's the timing of creating what is the parent organization and bringing the trading company underneath it. Um, so normally, you're right, it would be the charity setting up a trading company to generate surplus for the charity or for whatever reason they want to do that. Um, we came in after the trading company, but the trading company changed its name. So it's called UK ROED, um, and uh, I can't even remember off the life of my what it stands for. United Kingdom Offender, something education, education. thank you. Um, and so, but what happens now is it's actually um, a, virtual, a virtual circle um, of money. So basically the, the money that the public pay, it's completely transparent, our, our accounts are out there um, and they're online and I'd urge you to read them because the money that comes in, um, a lot of it goes back to the police straight away for the area where that person was caught um, in their road offence. Um, most of it then, the rest of it goes to the training provider and actually UK Road holds on to a, a couple of pounds. It's actually four pounds a head um, in order to be able to run the scheme. And the whole idea is that we should be able to run the scheme without generating a profit. But if you try to run a company without making any profit at all, um, you'd be so tight to the wire, it could be disastrous if they then made a loss. So we, we do have enough of a cushion that, you know, if it goes slightly over, we can probably carry that. Um, but if it goes under, actually what happens at the end of the year is what they don't need for working capital is gifted up to the charity, and then we give that out in grants to fund road safety initiatives. So, and the members of the charity are the 43 participating police forces around England, Wales, and Northern Ireland who they participate in the Endor scheme. Understood. Let's now take a look at then how that money is, is distributed. Okay. Um, when the Road Safety Trust started, 2014, it was a kind of anything goes type approach. You could put in an application for, for whatever you thought might grab the attention of the trustees, yeah. keep your fingers crossed, you might be lucky, <laughs> you probably wouldn't be. Now it's much more specific. Let's talk about your, fund, your calls for funding. How did you come up with those themes? We, um, well, I think it's fair to say that the first four rounds were a learning curve for both the grantees and ourselves. Um, so when we looked at it, we were in danger of veering into the realms of just being seen as a research funder, um, which is Yeah, there do seem to be an awful lot of universities. Yeah, because they're bloody benefited. good at writing applications, excuse my language, but they are experts at it, professionals even. So, um, and that was the danger. We didn't want to be seen as a, as a research funder. There's no point, and I'll talk about the journey, um, but there's, there's no point funding research if it's not actually going to make a practical difference. You know, we're, we're looking for practical impact on the ground to road safety in the country. And a piece of research might or might not have the legs to get there, but what we didn't want to do is end up in a trap of just funding research. So there's a whole spectrum of projects that we want to fund, research, dissemination, piloting and trials, and advocacy, and then, you know, with, a, with an aim of getting to practical intervention. Um, so th that was one reason why we took a look and said, we were funding some fairly large projects. We can fund up to £200,000. We do look for a little bit of match. But actually, the, the open response approach was very interesting on the one hand, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't us being strategic. It wasn't us saying we're going to focus on something tangible. So we went out to, funnily enough, we used the RSGB network quite heavily. We ran an online consultation. We asked people to feed into a survey about what they felt the important things were. You know, I was speaking to people last night. If you had a wadge of money, what would be your golden egg solution to road safety in this country? How would you use it? You know, that's the question we, we like to hear an answer from based on people who are the professionals in the industry. And that gave us 12 themes in order of crucialness, if you like, how people thought they were crucial or not very significant. Um, and that has determined now our series of funding themes for the next, I would say, at least three years. But 
hearing this morning and how behavioural change is in there, I'm actually thinking we might want to run an ongoing consultation so that after events like this, when it's fresh in people's minds, they can actually go on, on our website and, and feed in why, you know, what they think we should be focusing on as a funder. Because we'd love to hear from the practitioners in the sector, the people who are actually doing it every day. If we get a minute, we might take a couple of questions. Yeah. But um, let's just have a look, if, if that's OK, at just a, a very quick clip of one of the projects that you funded. And this is from, it's on YouTube, it's a BBC TV report about Virtual Road World. Dr Grissel approached us probably about two, three years ago for help with this road traffic project. And, and at the time, it was something that was really it connected with us because we're a city centre school. We've got a busy road at the front of the school. And so anything that we could do to help kind of, you know, help her research, which ultimately would go towards the goal of improving road safety, we were happy to do. All the research I've done and others have done suggests that actually children are not as good at those kind of perceptual judgments at the roadside as adults. Um, it became apparent to me that what we need to do really is think about um, whether or not children have a preference in terms of how they're learning about road safety. That actually children much prefer learning about road safety education if they're immersed in that environment. Now clearly we can't take children to the roadside and um, experiment. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. leave it just as quick as that. Virtual road, road World from University of South Wales, it moved then to the University of Cardiff. Cardiff yeah. um, an app that schools and kids can download mm -hmm. seems really practical. Yeah. So I suppose my question for that is, the research is done, the app's out there, how do you keep the momentum going to make sure that there's an impact? Well, actually, that's a really good example where we can, um, we can work with the project to... Uh, create impact. So they were very good at the development, very good at the production, but not so great at the getting getting it out to the target audience. Actually, that's not the university's strength. So we've worked with partners in the PR world to actually get the word out there that this product is there. So for seven to nine year olds, it's completely free of charge. So it's not like you're trying to do a hard sell. But the target audiences are the parents of the, and the schools, and um, the, the university themselves didn't have the resources or the expertise in their own teams to be able to go that extra leap to promote it. So we can help with that, and that's what we like to do. But just going back quickly, um, the, we've implemented small grants. So this is, I wanted to go back a, a step. What we've changed is we've implemented small grants, so people can apply for between 10 and 30,000 from us now which is probably not what the research institutions are interested in, so I'll say that quickly. That's an active measure by us to try and get some practical interventions coming into us um, that won't be so heavy on the research um, requirements or the evaluation. So, um, and the other one is big themes. So we've, we've finished our theme for this year. We're about to announce who's been awarded funding from that. But next year's theme, which everyone in here should start thinking about, is how technology can be used to um, promote safe driving and reduce road offending. So that was the most crucial theme that people came back to us and said, this is where we'd like to see the biggest amount of money going. So we've been building up to that. So that's to the 2020 theme. Opens in February, closes sometime in May. Let's, if, if anyone has a question that you would like to put to Sally at this point, um, an opportunity there if, if you're interested in... Yeah, the, there's somebody... Um, Somebody there, can we, can we send that cube up, please? Good. Tell us who you are and what you do before your question, please. Um, I'm Hannah, a road safety education officer from Staffordshire. OK, what's your question to say? Um, do you think children are really going to gain anything from learning the skills as a pedestrian by using a piece of technology? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, it wasn't without its evidence. So Dr. Catherine Purcell worked with 100 children on the development of it and 200 children with the prototype. And the rationale is it's, it's actually not designed to replace the traditional methods for helping children cross the road safely or, or you know, use the road system safely. Um, it's an additional complementary way of doing it. Interestingly, 78% of the accidents that children are involved with um, are about not looking properly. Um, and Catherine um, 
came out with, which what her finding was, is that actually, as parents, we instinctively shield our children when we're crossing the road with them. So they, they're not the ones looking out um, like the parents are. So inadvertently, we're actually overprotecting our children in the real life situation. It's a game, you know, the children go through levels of a game. And um, we've, you know, we've yet to see, it's hard, isn't it? Impact is really difficult. And this is what we're juggling with at the moment. It's going to be our major challenge over the next 12 months. How can I prove that any lives have been saved as a result of using that game? You, you, you sort of, you need something to work with first. And um, so we may never know whether it's having that, making that difference, but um, it was certainly additional and complementary to the existing techniques for children. Um, Thank you very much. Anyone else before we, we, we move on? Um, I don't know. I haven't missed anyone. OK, three tips from Sally for anyone considering making either a small grant application or a great big one. OK. You know, what, uh, well, so a couple of do's and a don't. Know, <laughs> knowing our objectives as a charity, um, you'd be in a very strong position if you were able to prove the potential impact of a project that you're applying to us for um, and how you would demonstrate that impact. So um, in terms of our vision, is safest roads in the world with zero road deaths and, and in serious injuries. Um, every project we fund, we look at how it's going to do that. So um, make that easier for us as to how your project is going to do. Um, some kind of evidence base, so not just plucking an idea out of the air and saying we think this will work. You know, look at what's been done already, and, and uh, as was said in the earlier panel, you know weigh that up against um, what your project is going to do that's based on something. It needs to be based on you know, a methodology or an approach that's already been evidenced in some way. Um, and the third one, expect to work with us in partnership. Um, you know, we're accountable for the money that we give out. Um, and we may be demanding as a funder, but that's for very good reason. And um, that's how we operate. So I think there's a sort of a preparedness on both parts to, t to deal with it as a partnership. We're entirely dependent on you as our project to meet your objectives. Um, so honesty, if you're not meeting your objectives, let's work together for how we deal with that. Um, so yeah, I think, I think uh, impact is the big one right now. And uh, looking at the next five years, what difference it's going to make. Sally, thank you very much. Stay right where you are, okay. because we'll, we'll crack on. As usual, time is against us. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to, to bring in our third guest now. Um, I was having a quick chat to him um, this morning. Um, and he said, actually, I should never have been here. It, I wasn't meant to be here. Someone else was, was coming. We'll find out what he means. Um, he was also in the midst of a spat with Nigel Havers um, <laughs> at the point that I was trying to get some sort of briefing from him about what we will talk about this afternoon. So there's a sense of almost anything goes with my next guest, Mr. Lembit Opik. Good, so what did you mean? You weren't supposed to be here. What's that all about? In February, I wrote to Nick, well, Nick Rawlings sent something to me, and I think it was about Vision Zero. And I don't like absolutes. And the idea that Vision Zero can be literally implemented is doubtful to me. So I put this long rant to some of my colleagues in the Motorcycle Action Group about it, and accidentally copied Nick. <laughs> so Nick says, if that's how you feel, come and talk about it at the conference. That's how I've ended up here. OK, well, we, we better make sure that I ask you some questions about that. There are a couple of interesting things, because we actually met on the roadside quite by chance. That sounds really year. bad. Yep. <laughs> I was out running. I live in the middle of Wales, um, and I was out running um, and outside the Bridge End Inn in a little village called Siswen between Brecon and Bilth Wells. Um, off I was going at my normal kind of slow plod, and, and there was Mr. Opic, wait, just about to go into the pub, so I'm afraid I followed <laughs> you, didn't I, With a, without knowing that we would be here. He um, said to me, you're quite prophetic, you said, would you be interested in doing a panel discussion in about nine years' time? <laughs> here I am. <laughs> and we've already, you're a Radio Kent presenter. That's right, I work I, on 
I was a Radio Kent presenter in 1992. Probably about the same salary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on was... BBC Radio Kent on 96.7, 104.0 on FM, on DAB, and now on Freeview Channel 719. A bit like what you did, yeah, Edmund. Indeed. Gosh. <laughs> Were you a radio presenter as well as a Never. battery salesman? No, no, I haven't done that one yet. Oh, OK, well, but you do there's always have, time. <laughs> but you do both have OBEs. He, he has interviewed me, though, on I have. Okay. I've interviewed yeah, yeah, you, yes, indeed. Yeah. I pretend I don't know people there. <laughs> You're really quite good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Let, let's just find out what was this quickly tell us about Nigel Havers then what I'm being uh, in the was it in the jungle I'm sorry well, I'm, I was interested I in the wrong. behavioral stuff with eight cameras I know what it's like to be filmed with 250 cameras in the jungle and Nigel Havers in 2010 when I was in the jungle I was with him and he's just not very good at jungle stuff basically in fact it's really irritating and uh, well, I, before we, before we go, let me just read what he said about you. Um, <laughs> when asked what it was about Lembit that annoyed him, he said everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's mutual, is it? It is now. Yeah. <laughs> Since he said that to Piers Morgan yesterday morning, uh, the guy was troubled. He was just a lot of trouble. He fell into the lake, he blamed me. Uh, all the way back from the hotel to... Uh, from, from when he walked out to the hotel, he blamed me. Now he's blaming me for leaving the jungle in the first place. He was in Benidorm in that programme. He'll probably blame me for that too. <laughs> really irritating person to be with. And, uh, and I say that with, without any shame or any guilt. So uh, I, think, I think my message to Nigel Havers is, if you're watching this video, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. <laughs> Maybe we can get him back on, on the panel next is, year. Is Who, that the mystery guest? <laughs> He's a great bloke. I really like him. I was going to start by asking you how good a motorcyclist you are on a scale of 1 to 10. But then I thought, no, let's first of all construct the scale. Let's get you... What, what does a, a 10 motorcyclist look like? What does a 5 motorcyclist look like before we put you on the scale? I prefer plus 5 to minus 5. OK. Uh, and not being completely neutral. A great motorcyclist anticipates, uh, recognises the risks that they're taking and is considerate to other road users and doesn't blame everybody else on the road, even when those other people are making mistakes. A minus five is somebody who thinks they're completely indestructible, that the road is a racetrack for their 600cc machine and brags about the fact that they've cut other people up on the road. Those people are a disgrace to motorcycling and an embarrassment to the entire sector. So we agree on something so far. Now, now I don't think we'll keep that agreement going, possibly. So where do you start to diverge with, uh, well, with, the, with the road safety community? Well, I know now from the earlier presentation, if I say I'm an aggressive driver, you all know that I'm a really bad driver. Uh, I would say that now I'm a plus two and a half. When I was 17, I was a minus three. Uh, I was, thought I was indestructible. Uh, I assumed that uh, the laws of physics didn't really apply to me. And by the fifth accident, I thought maybe I was wrong. So it's... Uh... So in which case, why did you allow this to happen? <laughs> yes. We do cut it before it gets too painful. But you, you didn't walk away from that, did you? Yeah, you were... I was stretched out. This is because that man, Cade Callas, I went along to this wrestling match, and for some reason he hated me. <laughs> maybe, maybe... Is he, was... is he a friend of Nigel Hayes? <laughs> no, he was a voter and I was a Liberal Democrat. And basically that's why he hated me. So uh, he, he started challenging me to a fight, to wrestle. I said, that's fine, I'll do it. <laughs> Thinking it would go away, but it didn't. <laughs> uh, Edmund says he's been caught out twice with the media in his lifetime. I've also been caught out twice a week by the media. <laughs> this is one of the times. So I got myself into a situation where I couldn't get out of the wrestling. Then I got some professional lessons, spent months learning to wrestle, and that's what happened. That was the result. <laughs> I had three broken ribs, got stretched out by Cade Callas, who then started following me around the country to start deriding me in various places. He's from, he's from Cardiff, and a little bit like Nigel Havers. As long as he's in Cardiff, he's a terrible bloke. 
But if he gets any closer, I'm just going to run out of here. I'm sorry, I'm not going to stay to the end, James. I just wish I could have shown that clip to my gran, who used to tune in every Saturday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon to ITV Wrestling. She that, would have loved that. That's all fake. That was real. <laughs> it I does look, have an element of real to it, for sure. Now, look, your journey from minus three to plus two and a half. Let's, let's just uh, follow you through that. How did that happen? Uh, first of all... Gravel rash, as we call it in biking. You're sliding down the road thinking, how did that happen? And then you do it again, and you do it again. Just to put this in context, when I started riding bikes in 1982, there was no training at all. You could get it, but you didn't bother. You just got your license, and that meant that you were the king of the road. So I learned the long and painful way. So that's him. That's him. Yeah, he's yeah. king of the road. I know. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, <laughs> see what you did there. Yes, OK. Yeah. My name, by an amazing coincidence, is an anagram of the phrase, I like to be MP. What are the odds? <laughs> the more dubious phrase, I kill to be PM, but there's enough trouble with Brexit at the moment, so I'm not getting into that one. So I started by sliding down the road lots of times. Then, I, I know the very day when my attitude changed, 1st of uh, January 1984, I rode off my parents' car. It was a Volvo. It's pretty tough to do. And uh, I realised I nearly died. I was probably closer to death with the bike accidents, but I just remember thinking, that's enough now. And my parents wouldn't let me drive the car for three years. Fair, fair trade, I thought. And I just remember thinking, it's not worth doing all the, the thrill-seeking stuff that that earlier presentation described if it's going to cost me my life. Literally, that's when it changed. Plus two and a half, because I don't think I've got the greatest road skill on two wheels, but I don't take the chances anymore. And it took nearly dying to do it. I think that was another point which was made earlier on. Can, it, can, it, can, you, can you pass on that for someone else who is a minus three to bring that, them up to plus two and a half without them having to go what you've been through? No, I don't think so. I think there has to be a way you feel the fear. Now, I think virtual reality could do it to an extent. You can, I've got a pilot's license as well, and there's no chance of being a minus three there because that means you die. And the, everything about learning to fly planes is about making you feel what it's going to be like if you get this wrong. I'm spinning planes, stalling them, everything, engine failures. Now, you can learn to fly something like a 737 just in a simulator. So it's theoretically possible to give you the direct experience you need. And I think there may be a technological solution. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Anybody at 17 or 18 has got better reactions than I have at 54. But I haven't got the right attitude. That's why the lowest insurance group, Edmund will correct me if I'm wrong, is in the 60s. Slower reactions, but they've got the experience. And they're not trying to prove anything. And I, I just don't know that you'll ever get away from that bravado that happens when you've got four 18-year-old kids on two wheels or four and the parents aren't watching. And I just think we have to accept that the weakness of that is also a strength in society because some of the greatest achievements are done by those who are fearless. The, Edmund, the, you the, must there come is in on that. One, one bit there that I think is changing that, and you know, I've got a son of 18, one of 17, and I'll tell you what it is. It's telematics insurance. The only way Finbar could afford to insure his car was having a black box. And it is amazing. Him and his friends, and I, I get the reports, are not breaking the speed limits. You know, whereas when I was 17 in my first Mini that cost 45 quid, you know, I was breaking the speed limits. And it is beginning, there were some stats I saw, I thought um, crashes were down 34% amongst 17 to 18 year olds. So that is the one thing that might make a difference. It's causing other problems though, because Driving out of St Albans, there's a road that's a 30 mile an hour road. Everyone thinks it's a 40 mile an hour road. And Finn says it's a complete pain because all these other drivers <laughs> in Volvos and whatever are tailgating him because he's sticking to the limit. But it is beginning to change some of the attitudes. So it might have some effect. Does that change attitude or do you just wait till you get away from it in the same way that you can be a responsible school kid until you go to mm. uh, Magaluf? Mm. And then you're free, and you see what happens in the news. Yeah. I think it's a bit early to say, but certainly for the moment, it, it does appear to be. But. Let's carry on, if we may, um, and just look at, at motorbikes. We've looked at your personal journey. Let's look at what's your, in your in-tray, uh, um, in your role. With, open your jacket, because you're presumably that's, that's man. Very that's corporate. a motorcycle action group. That's very corporate. Um, 
take, for example, Sadiq Khan's latest um, transport report, no mention of motorbikes. What, what, what's that all about? What's your re uh, reaction to that? Big picture for my entry is three things. Uh, it's uh, motorcycle access to roads, which has been squeezed partly because of the, the cycle lane obsession. Um, motorcycles as part of the modal shift solution to some of the environmental issues, uh, they're often ignored. And then this, this third thing, where motorcycles are completely ignored despite the fact that they tick so many boxes in terms of being quicker, even without speeding, because you can filter through, because they use fewer resources, and they're cheaper. Now, all of that's forgotten. Sadiq Khan has had a golden opportunity to achieve what he's talking about, reducing congestion, getting London moving, and he's ignoring it. I've met him, and he's not a bad bloke, but he seems to have this complete blind spot when it comes to power two-wheelers, when it comes to motorcycles and scooters. Uh, so we've got this ridiculous situation, for example, where if you drive a brand new Maserati, you don't pay the ultra-low emission zone charge, £12.50 a day, but if you've got a 25-year-old Honda C90, which does 140 miles per gallon, it's £12.50 a day. So the chap who goes to clean Sadiq Khan's bins in the morning has to pay £12.50 a day for the privilege when it used to cost him one and a half quid for the, for the trip. Total inconsistency. And that really, really bugs us because we've tried to reason with him and luckily the rest of the United Kingdom seems to have seen sense. But for us, this is immensely frustrating because it begins to look like virtue signalling from the mayor. And that's not a good basis for, poli for, for politics. I'll give you another irony here. Um, he says that these vehicles are highly polluting, some of these. 140 miles per gallon suggests not. So he's trying to force people who can afford the small motorbike and little else to go into the underground, where uh, particulate matter levels are 3,000% higher than they are on Marleybone High Street. It's just beggar's belief. So in terms of what you're doing for the Motorcycle Action Group, um, how much of an advantage do you think is it for them to have you and your high profile and everything you bring with you to, to raise awareness of, of motorcycling issues? And, and maybe does it hold it back at all in being you know, taken seriously, should we say? We're never going to get Nigel Havers to join. <laughs> but we do get other people to join because I got brought in about, hmm, must be six years ago, to professionalise the organisation. There's a plus and a minus. Ed and Sally can both confirm the media is a double-edged sword. And a lot of people don't realise I've got a proper job. After being in Parliament, perhaps no one thinks you ever have a proper job. But the reality is that you can trade profile for influence. And Sally's talked about that, Edmund's talked about it, and he does that, uh, including on the most influential station in Britain, that's BBC Radio Kent. Uh, and so you can use it as a tool. It's a bit like a martial art, to be honest with you. Uh, as long as you've got momentum, you can do something with it. Uh, but you have to have a narrative. Sally talked about narrative and recognizing the narrative that she has to get funding. Same goes for this. What's the narrative for Motorcycle Action Group? It's to make motorcycling a valid and visible uh, modal choice as we try to keep Britain moving. Now, it doesn't sound as glamorous as Easy Rider, but in reality, a very large proportion of people on two wheels just do it because it's cheaper and it's quick. And that is a totally legitimate reason for being on two wheels. Time's running away. Does anyone want to ask Lembit Opic a question? I don't want you thinking I'm sitting here and not taking heed. Um, in which case, we will have a few questions if there's time at the end. Lembit, bear with me, because I'd like to bring along our, our final guest um, for, for the afternoon. As long as there's not one person, that's fine. <laughs> I don't think, I don't, I don't know, I think he's rehearsing for Panto, isn't he? Oh, no, he isn't. Oh, <laughs> is he behind <laughs> Somebody me? Somebody oh, no. um, My final guest claims a relationship with Father Christmas. And what's the other thing? Oh, he just missed, a, missed, missed the cut on being a master of wine, as well as being in the road safety world for very many years. Please welcome Mr. Bill Smith. <laughs> Come along, Bill. How are you? 
Thanks. Welcome I'm along, Nigel Bill. I'm Nigel brother from oh. Glasgow. Don't, don't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Sally, how are you? We, it was going to be that or Fan Dabby Dozy. Ah, thank you. Nice to meet you, Jenny. Nice to see you again, James. I feel I'm a really an exalted company here. Um, the, 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 <laughs> what's, fact, what's... The, the last time I was probably in something like this was the day I had to serve Prince Michael some alcohol. Ooh. Prince Michael, uh, as you know, had been um, <laughs> Name the, the, dropping the, here. Yes, I know. Uh, the, the, the company I worked for at the time, we sponsored the Prince Michael International Road Safety Awards, and uh, as part of your duties, where when the Prince arrived at the Savoy, you had to take him up into the first floor, introduce him to all the, the prize winners. So his... Um, and get him his pint. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> his aide, um, Nick, came across and he said, Bill, would you mind... The prince will probably like a drink because his throat gets very, very dry meeting everybody and speaking. And I said, yeah, sure, Nick. I said, what, what does he drink? He may drink still water. He may drink fresh orange. He is partial to a glass of champagne, not Prosecco. He said, just go and get him the three of them. <laughs> so being a good um, servant type character, um, I walked across the bar and I said to the girl, the prince would like a drink. So I recited the three drinks and she put the three glasses down in front of me. Like that. And being a good glass region, I just picked him up. <laughs> walked him across and stood up and says, here you are, your, your highness. And his aide comes in. The prince does not take it from hand, Bill. Get a silver tray. <laughs> so that was me. I, I felt about that height as I walked back to the bar um, to, to hand it, to get a silver tray and bring it back to the, the prince. So, um, yeah. That's it. So I was surprised I was, I was invited up here. <laughs> You're welcome at any time. Well, could Thank someone you. bring a tray? Because if yeah, Sally yeah. wants a drink, we don't expect her to, to take it straight from hand. But tell me about Father Christmas. Who, how are you related to um, Father Christmas? My grandfather's great uncle, I was told as a child, was the first Father Christmas in Macy's in New York City. I think just oh. after or before the recession or whenever it was. But we were brought up that we were in some way related to, to Father Christmas. Wow. And that's why he couldn't come to our house, because he was busy in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, look, well done mm. last night. Congratulations. You, um, you have the kind of luxury of, of reflecting on, on road safety generally. Let, let's have a look at what you think has been a success and maybe what has, has, has not been quite so successful. Mm. Um, as far back as you can get, what, in, in your career, I guess. In, in, what in have been the time, winners and losers? Um, the winners and the losers, yeah. Um, going back to probably when I first started in the sort of mid to late 80s, when um, the road safety officer, the county road safety officer at that point, was sort of on a par with the county surveyor, I think, in terms of, uh, of salary. So I was just a young lad coming, uh, coming into it. Um, there was a lot of very powerful people, a lot of big beasts in road safety, as you may say, that carried a fair bit of power and were able to obviously um, develop a good number of policies. Um, obviously, the, the things that have been, been successful, and speaking purely from a Scottish point of view and probably a UK perspective up until certainly the, the, up until the 2000s was the targets, and it was already alluded to um, today by a number of the speakers. Um, and um, someone also mentioned from the audience in Scotland, we have been very successful because we've had targets, we had targets to aim for. Targets are also a very good thing when you're going to sell your individual thing, substantiate your existence, which so many road safety people probably in here today um, over a number of years. It has been very difficult um, uh, substantiating what you do. And as Sally said, it's very difficult to prove in, in some cases, particularly um, having come from an education, training and publicity background to try and prove that training works in certain aspects. I certainly think it's worked in speed awareness, which I think has been um, a, a big success. But publicity, um, yeah, it's difficult to prove, um, you know, in, in education. But certainly um, that and also the, the part that the motor industry has played, I think, has been quite dramatic in some of the... the Technological um, stuff that has come in there. I think someone mentioned today about well, technological doesn't do good things for you, um, IT side. But certainly, I think the motor industry has played its part along with uh, with targets and the hands-on um, speed awareness type thing. Yeah, particularly the Euro NCAP. Yeah. I mean, Euro NCAP. It's quite interesting story when it, when it was introduced because the manufacturers were totally against it, and British government stood up. AA and RAC got together 
And I remember when it was first launched at TRL, the first crash test where the Rover 100, the Mini Metro, is just awful. It almost made me physically sick watching it. And at the time, the motor industry tried to get journalists not to go to TRL, so they put on a swanky lunch at a Michelin uh, restaurant in the city to try and get them there. So I was phoning around saying, no, th this, this is groundbreaking. And, it, and it's proved to be, you know, from the cars back then till today, in terms of um, pedestrian safety, occupant safety, I, I think it's made a brilliant... That was John Dawson, wasn't it? Was John, it? I John asked was him what car he drove, and he wouldn't tell me. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a kind of uh, apposite, shall we say, but no, he, he, he wouldn't say. Um, moving on, let's look at how we work together. Any comments on, on how good or bad we are at, uh, you know, the word partnerships comes up so much. But how, Coming from how um, a point of view of having worked 27 years mm. in a local authority, then yeah. going to work with what literally became a PLC with, mm. um, through Don Boyfield, um, I had the experience of seeing that from a, a, a profit-driven point of view, not, not in a bad way, but you, when you do go around the country and have travelled mm. from Poole to you know, the, the, the North East, because there's nothing worse than have finishing a meeting at half past ten on a Monday morning in pool and hitting your sat and have home button and it says you'll be back in Glasgow in 12 hours. <laughs> it's a long time to, to yeah. travel. But yet a lot of the stuff that I, you see quite a bit of repetition um, throughout, throughout the, the, the UK and I think a lot of road safety people do recognise that right from child develop, um, development of child resources, um, seeing them so happen um, resource bases like the Knowledge Centre, Road Safety Observatory, there is quite a bit of um, you know, duplication, I think, that could be, could be addressed in some way, and I think RSGB are trying to address that by pulling a collective you know, together in terms of what can, what can be delivered. Um, Road Safety Scotland, um, financed by Transport Scotland, obviously, um, has been, over the years, recognised as an exemplar of good practice in pulling, pulling stuff together. Um, and that percolates down um, to, you know, the, the likes of myself where I'm now working with Scotland Trans Serve and Operating Company. Um, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of good stuff happen, but there is still is some duplication throughout the, the different authorities throughout the, the UK. And reinventing the wheel is something you're, you're very um, cross when that happens. Yeah, it's, too it's, much um, it's something when you, particularly when you look at the, um, the news feed in, uh, in RSGB and you see a certain resource being produced and you say to yourself, well, that's, you know, that's out there. But I do understand a lot of authorities have to substantiate their own um, being. So that there is, if they buy something in from outside where it's already been developed, it's, uh, I think it's probably quite difficult when a lot of the, um, the human resource is, is within, um, it, you know, is held, held within. But yeah, I mean, you, you do see it all the time, and I'm sure there's a lot of people also out there all, all have seen it as well. Well, just imagine you're road safety minister for the day. You've got a blank piece of paper. You can do what you want. And, you, you know, you've got five, five things you can do. You can take stuff away. You can add limitless budget. What do you do? I think one of the things I would like to see is in terms of getting proper data through. Um, I would like to see something along of the, the lines of the Air Investigation Bureau being used for crash investigation, um, where, it is, um, you know, it's, where it is thorough. Um, because it, someone has always said to me, if you, if you don't start off with good data at the start and work out from that, don't go into a preconceived idea. If you've got something that we know we can, we can feed into, because something that we experience now is actually getting good, um, correct, robust data um, you know, from an officer um, at the scene of an accident, putting that information together and, 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 and bringing that out. So certainly that's one of the things I would like to see finance. One thing I would probably throw out there, because... People always talk about, yesterday we had the, the gentleman, the policeman from Lanc um, Lancashire with a, using a place of road guttering, uh, uh, you know, uh, road safety on a shoestring. Um, I, I don't know how it would be if, like the, the case in Northern Ireland where the DO, the, um, the Department for the Environment, ran the road safety education service. Now, I don't know if there is a role for big government actually taking over the delivery um, of the road safety ETP service within within the UK, um, so that, that you know the money is ring-fenced, the money is there, um, access to good development, the sharing of resources, uh, it's all there. That's just one thing I would, I would throw into the, uh, into the mix for, you know, for, for debate. Um, 
you know, so that's the sort of first two things that, that certainly come, in, come into my mind. Working, obviously, in closer conjunction with the, the motor manufacturers, another thing um, that was mentioned a couple of years ago, that every new car sold, that there should be some sort of tax put on that that went back in to fund and, re and generate the, the, the road safety. Um, stuff a bit probably like what the Road Safety Trust are getting mm -hmm. through the hypothecation, if that's still the word they're netting off or whatever it's, whatever it's called. But that's the sort of three off the top of my head, James, any more than that. Well, you, re you relax a minute, right. Bill, because <laughs> as we draw to a close, let me just give um, Sally Lembit and M. Edmund the, the opportunity to, to add to our list, because that will help us just sort of uh, conclude matters. Sally, what would you do if you were Rhodes Minister for the day? I had this conversation with people at the dinner table last night. You know, if you had all the money you needed, what single thing could help road safety in this country? And the answer wasn't what I was expecting. So I'm gonna, but I'm going to use that answer because I think it's coming out more and more and maybe the environmental drive has actually taken over the thinking somewhat. But getting people out of their cars and using other forms of transport, it seems to be where people are coming from. Um, so I, I'm, I'm thinking this one through about how can, we, um, how can we work with that as a trust to help to get to that end point. Um, although in 50 years' time, we might all be going around in bubble cars that do their own thing without having to touch anything. So uh, it's rather scary. I think the transition to that is, is going to be the, the bit in the middle. But well, in a moment, we're all going to be teleported off here. So that yes. we can see where we go or what happens to any of us. OK, Lembit, from you. Yep. Strategically, end this positive discrimination towards bicycles. And the reason I say that is because the investment is totally out of proportion to, uh, it may be unpopular, but I'm saying this, uh, out, of, out of proportion to its economic and social importance. Despite trying to f really drive this, it's just not got the kind of long-term take. Up. One bad winter and things will change as well. And just safety-wise, We've got evidence to show that the introduction of, of hard separation cycle lanes in London is increasing the KSI rate for bikers. And within all, all of this discrimination, it's not just about bicycles, this discrimination, the smart motorways point, I totally agree with Edmund. What are you supposed to do if you break down on the fast lane on a motorbike? You take your helmet off, you get your phone out, and you sit there for 34 minutes, waiting for somebody to stop you from getting wiped out in a rear-end shunt. If anyone would like to volunteer sitting there in the fast lane on a broken iron bike on the M1 for 34 minutes, you'll very quickly get the sense of what Edmund said. It just doesn't make any logical sense. And I just don't buy what the, the Highways England says So my, uh, about this. So, so my advice would be, end positive discrimination towards any one mode of transport and have a level uh, and database playing field. Um, let's just come on. Is that Colin? Yeah. I recognise you from a video. Um, shout out your thoughts just very quickly. Colin Evans, Highways England. Firstly, I've got to say I'm, I'm very disappointed that there's no right of reply here on this yeah. drive against smart... Well, there is. I've just given it you. Well, there hasn't been. <laughs> Because by and large, simple answer, Reason. you bodge it. You get onto the hard shoulder. So on, in, in, in most circumstances, in the but, <laughs> because you, you can have an engine seizure, thing. for example. I've had an engine so, seize so up. How, so how does it make you can coast. You can pull the clutch in and coast so to the hard shoulder. You do that on, on a smart motorway. You get off the live lane. There's room to get a motorbike off the line. OK, uh, just, I just don't buy that. You, you talk to... Uh, wait a minute, can I just be clear? I have a really high opinion about Highways England because they've got a motorcycle working group and it's tremendous. I, I'm not here to rubbish Highways England. You really have been proactive when it comes to bikers. I don't want to give the impression I have it in for Highways England. It's a specific concern which four former um, transport ministers have raised, Edmund has raised. I don't want to go to war with you on it. We just want to have a common sense solution. And maybe I do have one. And I think well, that's, we'll let you carry that on um, afterwards because we're really kind of short on time. Um, just very quickly, from shout something out. Who are you and um, what's your comment? Yeah, I'm, I'm wrong. I, I brought Lambert's uh, uh, claim that there shouldn't be any discrimination against any particular mode of transport. Uh, but equally, I noticed that there is a representative for motorists and there's a, a, a representative for motorcyclists, but I see no representative for 
uh, uh, cyclists or pedestrians. So uh, uh, that's really an observation, especially <laughs> when you know another of your guests is actually saying one of the big things will actually move people away from those particular no. modes of travel. Well, look, we, no. we make the best of the, of the panel that, that we have, and I'm, I'm, I think between them they've all given us lots, lots of interesting things to talk about. Um, Edmund, let me just conclude with no, you my, because my you're, simple thing, you have so one thing if, to yeah, add Transport to this. Minister, I would pull together Department of Education, the Home Office, I'd have more cops in cars, I'd have more education in schools at an early stage. It's not just about transport, it's about changing the whole government, the whole thinking towards it. And that's the way I'd do it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for an afternoon with these four excellent people and with you. Thank you.